Testing, one, two, three, good. Good morning, happy Sabbath. As the pastor said, it is a beautiful morning. You know, even just because the sun's not shining, you have to praise God for the, uh, the, the sunny days and the rainy days, but it is, it's beautiful to be here. It's beautiful to be alive. It's beautiful to be here studying God's word. Uh, welcome to the adult online Bible study class. It's a pleasure. It's my privilege to um, be the facilitator today, and I'm happy to be here. And as the pastor indicated, um, I was a bit overwhelmed when I sat down to study the, study the lesson earlier in the week, and I said, um, much like there was a lesson that talked about history, and I said, I was not a history buff in the least, and when it comes to arts and scientists, I'm about as artistically inclined as probably no one. You know, I, I couldn't tell you Monet from a, from a Picasso or anything else like that, but um, thank God we have the Word of God because it grounds and rooted us and grounds us. So when we're talking about arts and scientists, sciences from a biblical perspective, it takes on a whole different meaning. And um, that's why I love the Bible study lessons, and that's why I love um, being a facilitator and learning as I go along and as I study. Um, it's lesson number 10. We've been studying about education in general, and we're talking about uh, education in the arts and sciences. And surely, um, the Bible does have some uh, verses that we can look to and learn from uh, with regards to education about the arts and sciences. Our memory text is taken from Psalm chapter 19, uh, verse 1, and it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. I like that, um, that, that verse because it, there's, it goes on in, in Psalm 19, um, it goes on further when you, when you study it in the other different types of versions, but um, there are many um, aspects of it that uh, uh, when, we, when we look at that verse and, and what the Bible talks about God and his design and his creative work, present day education assumes that God is not take part in the natural processes. The assumption rejects any supernatural phenomenon, the idea of a past without death, or that the universe was created suddenly by an almighty God. Science has to be able to study and learn everything from a, um, either a petri dish or from a lab or, for, or inside of a, um, a, a laboratory under a microscope. They feel that if something cannot be recreated, if something can't be proven inside of a laboratory, then it must not be true, and that anything, in order for it to be proven true must be able to be recreated. So that kind of, that whole scientific worldview can shape a person in what they believe and why they believe it. Because if you believe that, then you don't believe that God created the universe and you don't believe in supernatural forces. Um, you don't believe that there is an eternal self-existing God and you're not gonna believe that the world came in the way it did. So um, when we're talking about the biblical perspective, as Christians, our education must include those concepts. They will help us to make the most of our education in arts and sciences. A few um, lessons back, we studied about the biblical worldview. It's almost like a pair of glasses that when we look at everything in our universe, when we live our lives, when we go about our daily walk with, with God and with the, each other, when we have those spiritual glasses that we look at everything from a biblical perspective, it can change our whole thought process. And that's why scientists oftentimes fall. If they believe in Darwinism, if they believe in evolution, if they believe in um, uh, that we were just evolved from, from primitive life forms, then you're gonna look at things a little differently. And everything that you study and everything that you learn is going to be with that, that I would call it like a foggy pair of glasses. You're looking at through glasses that you're not seeing clearly through. So our Christ, as Christians, we look at everything from a biblical perspective in terms of it. So the basics of these, this week's lesson, we're going to talk about a foundation of education, God in education in sciences, God in education in arts, education, how to avoid common mistakes that are made by um, science so falsely called, and then seeking excellence, and what to do at the end when, when there are conflicts between faith and science. Sunday's lesson was entitled, The Lord Alone. Um, and for the purposes of the PowerPoint, it's titled, God in Education and Sciences. Psalm 139, verse 13 and 14 says, For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Uh, yes, uh, Sister Mangela, you had a question, comment. Daniel was taken. 
taken captive, and he went through all these lessons that the Babylonians did, and still his faith was so strong. And that should be the education that we would be giving our children, even when they are educated in public school system, they learn what they learn, but that's not the belief. Right. That there should be a distinction between learning that and that not influencing your life. Yeah, and, and Daniel's a, a prime example because um, when we study the life and, and of Daniel, we do know that whatever training he had as a very young lad must have been some kind of training from his mother and from his parents because it, he was so rooted and grounded in the faith that he had that ability to um, know and understand that, you know, despite that Babylonian education, despite the fact that they took his name, they, they made him a eunuch, the fact that they, took, they gave him a new name, they, they educated him in Babylonian arts and literature and, and science and religion, yet he still maintained his, his original beliefs and he refused to defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. So Daniel, yes, thank you, Dr. Manjo, for that example. So yes, education sometimes, um, you know, you can have five PhDs, but unless you have that biblical knowledge or that worldview, you're not going to um, uh, take it on, take it on, so. Um, as we said, Sunday talks about there is evidence of the living God in all of his creation. Um, we do know that even, I love this illustration that's up there on the PowerPoint, and we, we see um, the little baby in the womb, the fetus, and the lesson talks about how God in his infinite wisdom and his design designed it that the baby grows in the mother's womb in a very conspicuous place, that the baby is close to the mother's heart, that the baby can hear the mother's heartbeat, that the baby can hear the mother speaking, that the baby can, um, you know, as the belly's growing, everyone can see that a woman is pregnant. And you think about the design of that, and um, there was one time, um, a few, this was going back a few years, I was teaching uh, one of the lessons, and um, a group of very young people were in my class. I think they were visitors from another church, and somehow the topic came up about abortion. And um, it's pretty interesting, and I oftentimes um, wonder how some Christians can actually believe that abortion is okay. And um, even some even quote Bible verses to say that abortion is okay, that a, that a fetus is not a life, that because a fetus has not taken a breath yet, that they are not life. But we know from a biblical, again, this is something that unless we look at things from a biblical perspective, unless we read and study the Bible, um, you know, they use this, this verse in Exodus 21 that talks about, you know, just before that, that famously misquoted verse about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, there's a verse in there that talks about what, what would happen if a mother with baby were injured, and they use that verse to say that, oh, well, you know, it wasn't a death decree, so it's okay to, to take a fetus. So um, there are so many Bible verses that contradict this. Job 31.14 says, What then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? And in verse 15 he says, did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? So we see God's creative work even inside the womb. Um, Psalm 22.10, I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Psalm 71 verse 6, by you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. So we see that um, even, and, and you think about John the Baptist, that as Mary was approaching um, her cousin Elizabeth, Luke 1.44, For lo, as soon as the voice of your salvation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So people have this conception that a fetus is, um, is just a fetus, that it's, 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 a, it's a group of cells. And uh, we know that, that um, as Adventists, and, and this is something that I think it was in 2019 that the Adventist Church officially came out with a statement on our view of abortion, and um, they were going to vote on it at the General Conference as an official statement of the church. Um, but again, our official position is that abortion, as the commandment says, thou shalt not kill, which means thou shalt not murder, and that includes abortion. 
Um, so, yeah, in, in that aspect, yes, uh, uh, Sister Mangela, you have another question, comment? Um, so, um, Green mic, please. So it is very clear that um, God is the creator of the fetus and he forms in the womb. You mentioned something about general conference taking a vote. Why should there be even a vote saying that it is right? It is absolutely right. They well, shouldn't. Well, you'd be surprised. There's actually debate even within the Adventist Church. There, there are those that still believe and hold to the to the to what the world teaches is that that it's a mother's right and it's a mother's body and it's her own body and that she has a right to do with it. And and there's many debate about it. And but I mean. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shy away from the topic because it, it's, it's involved in, we're talking about science and God and education and sciences and we're talking about a biblical perspective, but um, it was something that, because there's even some debate because they think that it's a Catholic teaching to be anti-abortion, believe it or not, which is why some Adventists even shy away from it. But I mean, when we study the Bible and we study it clearly like that, I think, I think there's no question, at least not in my mind. I see um, the pastor, I mean, Brother Cohen, go ahead, you, you have a uh, we got a purple mic there. Good. Okay. Great. Um, I just want to say something. Um, I think what we should do uh, is to keep in mind that uh, religion and science, you know, they complement. They should complement each other, mm -hmm. not to antagonize each other. Right. Uh, we should tell the, 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 our children that uh, you know, God is the creator, that's true, but they don't have to be shy on uh, uh, request uh, or, or of thinking and uh, of the processes and what's going on. I think the Bible encourages us to search, to discover, to ask, to look, um, and uh, to keep an inquisitive mind on the things that surrounded us. And of course, the God is the one, it is the creator, no doubt about it, but it's good to discover and see what the processes are and yes. how, how the, the sharp mind and uh, intelligent mind of God created all these things and what is the base of, of, of all these things functioning. Um, and um, you see, if you look in the history, great minds put the God in front before they did discoveries. Yeah. And, and things. Yeah, definitely. And, and a prime example, one I was going to illustrate later on, is Galileo. Galileo was a Christian, right? And at his time, it was believed that the earth was the center of the universe and that everything revolved around the, the earth. And he was one of the first to come up with the concept after studying the stars and the heavens that, no, that the sun, that seems to be movement in the universe and that it doesn't seem that the earth is standing still, that it's might be the sun that is standing still and we're revolving around it. And he was persecuted and he was almost going to be um, uh, uh, put to death or murdered by the, by the Roman Catholic Church at the time during, during the Dark Ages and during the times of persecution and the uh, Spanish Inquisition. So um, he had to almost renounce and basically shy away from it because they were going to, because only because he was older and he was ill at the latter part of his life that they were, they were going to put him to death if he had confessed to believing that they, they, they thought that that was, um, that was blasphemy and it was, uh, it was um, uh, 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 against the Catholic Church teaching at the time. It was heresy. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. Yeah. And, and, and we'll to look at the Speaking to the mic so the people at oh. Why don't you use, why don't you look at the greatest mind of our scientists, Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. which Actually, he admitted in the end that God is the one that... Yeah. So... I, I think there's so many other discoveries out there that if, if scientists were viewing things from a Christian perspective, that there would be so many other discoveries that we would just, in fact, go back and find out that the Bible was true all along, which is what happens. Um, um, Pastor, I'm sorry, was there a comment or a question? Uh, a couple of things. <clears throat> yes. We have a comment here from our sister Ella who says the Holy Spirit is our only source of Yes. We also have a statement here. If they say we evolved from apes, why is it not still happening? And how do evolutions explain this? So the transitional there is uh, one of the things that. Uh, another statement here is the fact is Galileo believed in God in the Bible and did so for his whole life. 
initial trouble was not with the church, but with the academy, so where he was working with. So the other thing I just wanted to make a statement too regarding uh, uh, like what Dr. Mangela said, you know, the, the, the general conference makes statements to help affirm things. It's right. not that we need to look at them as the final authority. So there are things that, let's just use the Sabbath, for example, as the seventh day, and they affirm that by making that statement out, and it helps the members with their organization to be able to say, yes, our church affirms this teaching, this biblical belief. So it's right. not that they're deciding whether it's right or wrong, they're just simply making those statements that helps the membership around the world to be able to identify with the church and saying that, yes, the GC has said this, because sometimes people do get in debates over these things and they're right. uncertain and they do look to the leadership of the church, right. just like a church would look to a pastor to be the spiritual guide to reaffirm and confirm the teachings of the Bible. And yeah. so that's, that's an important thing that we have to have. Yeah, and, and if you go to the North American Division website, if you go in there under beliefs, there is a whole long statement with regards to abortion and the biblical uh, passages that I just quoted, because I used that as, as I was studying for this lesson, um, to affirm that. And, and just in, in, on this, this passage here, Psalm 139, if you, for, you, for you formed my inward parts, you covered me. That word covered, um, in another translation, uses the word knitted. So if we think of God knitting the fetus together, and, and not to get graphic, but if you think about then a pair of forceps coming in and ripping that apart piece by piece and then scraping it out later, I mean, I, I just, it blows my mind that sometimes people um, try to believe that, oh yeah, because it's, it's a woman's body that it's her right to do that, and, and it's just, um, it's really uh, upsetting. But um, in terms of a biblical perspective, yes. When we study how God designed life and genetics and the conception process, we see the wonders of his kind love. For example, he decided that the fetus would go close to the mother's heart um, and that the mother would be able to see how the baby grows within her. You can't ignore that because we do know that there's a, there's a connection there and it's, a, it's an intimate connection that I believe it almost mirrors the relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so we look at the natural world and we see that when science studies the natural world and we see that there are forces and there are things that science cannot explain, we have to understand that there is a God. And even in the natural world, as Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. That those people, you can just look and study at the natural world and you can understand that you can see that there was a design in everything that was created and the amount of... of um, uh, variety and the amount of, of, of beauty that God used in the designing of the world, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yes, Pastor. Uh, so we have here, so the question was, and I guess they were expecting a, an, an answer from you. So the, there's a question here, if they say we evolved from apes, why is it still not happening and how do evolutionists explain this? So how would your response be? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we covered this in a, in a few lessons ago with regards to evolution. And um, I, you always say that because if, if we could take the last even 100 years, surely we would see some type of evolution, even in our very own selves. Maybe we would, um, I, I don't know, because if you, if you believe in evolution, evolution, if you were to take a portion of it, because they, they say, well, how did the giraffe, for instance, get its long neck? Oh, well, he evolved it over millions and millions of years. So we would have to take a tendency to think that, okay, well, then other animals would start evolving over this same period of time that we could, we could just take a micro section of it and see it. And it doesn't exist because the giraffe got its long neck because God gave it the long neck because he designed it that way. You can look at something and see that it was designed. It's not something that evolves because we see nothing in the natural world that is evolving. Okay, nothing is evolving. We don't see, um, uh, you know, because maybe it, it's, if they're claiming global warming, maybe we would get, we would, we would start, um, I don't know, uh, growing a second set of skin or something to keep us warmer or, or cooler or whatever, but, but you don't see that in the natural world. Um, yes, go ahead. So, so evolutionists have several different answers for that. You'd have to Google it to get the most recent one, yeah. but the, this is definitely a difficult question to answer with evolution because we have no record of the transitional fossil that they're missing. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for them to, to give a, a, a logical or a, an intelligent explanation for it. So it's hard for us to answer for evolutionists. That would be something you'd have to see what their most current explanation is. Right. Um, and Dr. Mangel, you had a question as well? Um, it, it is an adaptation of a species to something that they're exposed to. I don't 
think it is evolution at all. A species uh, growing um, a long neck or you know short neck or anything, it adapts to the environment. It is not completely changing from one animal to another or one human being to another. It's an adaptation that comes along. Like if you are living in a tropical area where it is hot all the time, you adapt to that environment. And if you move to another area with a cold climate, you adapt to that. Certain things that you do and your body does is adapting to that environment. It is not evolution. Yeah, because then if you mix in evolution with Darwinism and you say, well, it's survival of the fittest and that only the strongest will survive, then everything that is alive now would te have, have a tendency to be the strongest thing that ever lives. And, and everything that, it, that has grown has um, now become extinct was because they were, they were lesser or inferior. Um, and that theory, it's just, it, does, it doesn't make sense. I like this um, quote from Sister White in the Ministry of Healing. God's handiwork in nature is not God himself in nature. The things of nature are an expression of God's character and power, but we are not to regard nature as God. The artistic skill of human beings produces very beautiful workmanship, things that delight the eye, and these things reveal to us something of the thought of the designer. But the thing made is not the maker. It is not the work, but the workman that is counted worthy of honor. So while nature is an expression of God's thought, it is not nature, but the God of nature that is to be exalted. In the creation of the earth, God was not indebted to pre-existing matter. All things, material or spiritual, stood up before the Lord Jehovah at his voice and were created for his own purpose. So it's clear, it's a clear understanding. Yes, Bill, I see your hand up. Uh, we got the gray mic, that is. Yeah, gray one. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, yes. It's really quite interesting with all this controversy going back and forth. It's actually science that's changing more our way. If you look at, they're starting to study Darwin's theory and they're seeing some major flaws in it. And they're starting to think more to the biblical understanding than, than, the, than the, just a the pure scientific understanding. The idea that they discovered what they call the God particle, what they're realizing there's, there's other layers of subatomic particles out there. That they're starting to understand that there's so much that they don't know. They can't be that certain. They have to stop that. And they're coming back really to the Christian way of thinking. If, if you look at a lot of the scientific uh, recent studies, so they're, they're backing off, not just being pragmatic. They're looking at the fact that they have to be self-circumspect of what they're back to study because maybe they've drawn some wrong conclusions. Yeah. And that's what I've been seeing when I read the, a lot of the scientific literature. Yes, yes. Thank you for that comment. Uh, yes, Pastor. A comment here online says, when we look at nature and the human body, it's clear that they were designed by a supreme intelligent being. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I, I could pull out my smartphone and, and, and I could look at it and say, well, okay, well, it has a design. It's, it's designed for something. Someone made it. It didn't just evolve on its own. But you think about just the human eye. Just take the human eye by itself. The infinite um, capabilities of the human eye, science cannot reproduce it. And pe they can't even explain how the, how the eye is able to do what it does. But you look at the human body and, and the infinite... Um, uh, complexity of the human body and the human brain and, and, and how the skeletal and muscle systems all work together and it's, it's not something that could happen by, by chance. You can just look at it and see that it was, it was fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, uh, Elder Dan Allen. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> Sister Boyd, she says in Christ Object Lesson, the book of nature is a great lesson book which in connection with the scriptures we ought to use teaching others of his character and guiding lost the sheep back to the fold of God. Yeah, you know, we, God's design in nature, like the, the, like the opening um, verse says, you know, the, 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 the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Look up at the sky and just, you think about how this earth is able to, um, how life is able to be sustained here in, in our atmosphere, how it protects us from the UV lights, UV rays, and if we were, the earth was tilted 20 more degrees on its axis, we couldn't live here. If it was a few more miles away from the sun, we probably wouldn't be able to live here. But it just, even the human atom itself, when scientists study the atom, they, have, they can't explain how it even stays together, right? But we do know that it's the power of God that holds everything together. It's everything consists and persists because of him. 
So, um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Monday's lesson, the beauty of holiness, <clears throat> and for our purposes, God in education and arts. He has made everything beautiful in its time. So here's my question to you. Are all things beautiful good? No, no good, that is a very quick answer. Give me an example of something that is beautiful that is not good. You're quick on the answers, and I'll give you an example. What's that? Snakes? Yeah, yeah, snakes. Uh, look at a nice big uh, boa constrictor or an anaconda. L lovely to look at, but not, not, not nice to get close to, I would, I would say. That's what... Oh. They have been in South America. They are people, but they Yeah, even some of the poison dart frogs, they're, they're wonderfully made and they're beautiful to look at. Bright red colors. I mean, you look at a coral snake with the bright red colors, and yes. Yes, Paul. Hold, hold on a second, Paul. We want to hear, we want the online uh, uh, members to be able to hear your, your thought or your question. Uh, Gray, Mike. Can you hear me now? Oh, great. Yes, great. Uh, my mother used to uh, take care of this plant called Christ's Thorns. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful plant, has beautiful little red flowers. But man, those thorns, you've got to watch out for them. Yeah. And it's a beautiful plant, but be very careful when you yeah. touch it because you're going to really stick yourself a lot. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and there's, there's, there's many other examples. I, I think of a biblical example, right? The, the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Was it a good-looking fruit, a good-looking tree? Yeah, Eve said it. When she saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of it and she ate of it, right? So um, not everything beautiful is good. So here's the converse. Is everything good beautiful? Give me an example. Is everything good, beautiful? We heard a quick no, but I'm waiting for an example. I'll give you a prime example, okay? And this is the biggest example, and it's a biblical example. The man, Christ Jesus. Okay, what do we know about the man, Christ Jesus, when in the concept of is everything good, beautiful? What does the Bible say about the man Christ Jesus? Isaiah 53. He has no form or comeliness, and we, he, when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, you often see these, these dramatized, and we're talking about arts and scientists, and these, these artists' interpretations of what Jesus looked like, and he's got these big, beautiful blue eyes, he's got this long, curly, hair and he's got this nicely trimmed beard and, and oftentimes he may look like um, you know he was he was in perfect stature and he was tall and he was handsome and that's not what the Bible says okay if you saw him and you passed him on the streets of Galilee before all the crowds were, 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 were surrounding him you'd probably pass him up just like any ordinary person because there was no beauty or comeliness in him and, and in God's infinite wisdom he did, it was prophesied that way because it wasn't going to be the outward appearance that was going to draw people to him, right? And, and that's a prime example. But we look at nature and we see the snowflake and the design of a snowflake. Once they were able to look under microscopes and see what a snowflake looks like, the, the symmetry in a snowflake, it's just amazing. He's the source of beauty. He's the source of, of physical and spiritual beauty, beauty. It says that we must come to him if we want to worship him. We must worship him in the beauty of holiness. Yes, Pastor. A uh, comment here online. Not all beautiful things are good for us. <laughs> That's right. Yes. And then there's just plenty of things that, you know, uh, a nice chocolate cake, it looks very good. You know, <laughs> it's beautiful, boy. I see yeah, it. Let's, let's leave see the cake chocolate, alone. Huh? I see that chocolate cake in, the, in a bakery. Oh, boy. That looks really beautiful, but it's just not, you know, not, not the best thing for us. So we, everything in moderation, as they say. But. Um, the beauty of holiness, not everything beautiful is good. Solomon warned us about sinful people. Do not lust after her beauty, even a strange woman. You know, they, Solomon talks about all those, you know, those women that look pleasing to the eye, but again, at the end, they're going to drag you to sin. Eve learned this the hard way. Not all that is pleasant to the eyes and desirable is also good. Okay. So we talk about beautiness and we talk about God. You know, he, he is a lover, Sister White wrote, of the beautiful. He is a lover of the beautiful. And you look at his original design, 
and even now we still see it faintly of what the what the creator did in the beginning but i can imagine what the garden of eden looked like you know to be able to see that that world where there was no sin you know this world is marred by sin and it's slowly degrading and degrading and degrading the ground is cursed that we that we walk on and we know that this earth is animals creation all of creation moans and groans from the penalty of sin and and it's all interwoven into this world but yet we can still see God's creative work in it and you can still look up at the sky at night you can still um, look at uh, the, the, the mountains the hills the valleys the beauty of a flower in springtime and those things are still there for, for, for us to see and, and it shows us uh, images of places of God avoiding common mistakes oh Timothy keep that which was committed to your trust and profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, 1 Timothy 6.20. You know, I like the, the King James Version is the only one that, that calls it that, but science falsely so-called. Because it's people oftentimes, you know, how long did science think that the earth was flat, right? How many years did people believe and science thought that the earth was flat? They got on ships and they went to sail to circumnavigate the world and they were afraid to get in ships and sail because they thought at some point they were going to fall off the end of the earth, right? So how long did science teach that the earth was flat? How long did science teach that the earth was the center of the universe and everything revolved around it? So how many things have we been taught in science class and how many things have we been taught through, through our, you know, worldly education that, that are false, that, that, you know, the Bible is going to prove that they were false. And, the, you know, this, this, these theories of evolution, the Big Bang theory, the Big Bang, uh, you know, the, 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 his theory of evolution, all these are theories, and they're exactly that, and yet they're taught as though they are truth, you know, and they're not, and they're not. So, avoiding, we have to avoid common mistakes. Because of the innate, if, innate evil in sinful human beings, science and art have been used for wicked purposes too frequently. You know, we oftentimes, um, when we see, we look at it at, at exactly that. We look at nature and we look at science and we look at art and we, we oftentimes get this distorted image of God and we get this distorted image of our world around us. But like I get it, again, I always go back to a biblical world view. It's like putting on a pair of glasses, you know. So, uh, my eyes are starting to get a little bit bad. I can, I, I'm getting harder to, it's getting harder to read the fine print, but when I put the glasses on, I can see things and I can actually read them for what they are. So it's the same concept when we look at a worldview. When we put on a spiritual set of glasses and we look at things from a, a creation point of view, from a, a, a God-created point of view, we, look, we see things differently and we understand things differently. And I think it is that presupposition that when a scientist does not believe there is a God, that God's not going to show him divine things because he's not, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So a scientist who's, who's an atheist and who denies the presence of God and, and, and will take that to his grave, God is not going to reveal that to him. But I believe a, a, a Christian scientist with a biblical worldview who sincerely wants to learn truth and, and find truth and study truth We'll find it. I, we see this even in the archaeologists when they dig and they uncover things throughout the Middle East and then they, they find out, oh yes, the city of Nineveh was an actual city. You know, or they, they, they find things under Babylon and they realize, oh yes, Babylon was an actual city. And these stories from the Bible are not just fables, but they are in fact historical accounts of things that actually happened. Mm -hmm. So, on the other hand, science has not always been completely right. For example, the experts believed the Earth was the center of our universe many, many years ago. And Galileo, and it's, it, it, I go back to that, you know, when I was studying uh, with regards to what he had to endure with regards to the Catholic Church and, and being labeled as a heretic because he was going to teach that. Um, you know, it's, it's something that he, they wanted him to confess to his heresy and he refused to confess to it and then they kind of they were caught in a quandary because they couldn't put him to death if he didn't confess it. and they were going to actually torture him but because of again he was old and he was um, feeble at that time they didn't do it so um, yes avoid we want to avoid errors and, and science so seeking excellence but earnestly desire the best gifts and yet I show you a more excellent way 1st Corinthians 12:31. Students of the arts and scientists utilize their talents to gain knowledge and to pursue excellence in their studies. We can be capable of artistic brilliance and scientific breakthroughs because of knowledge and ability. 
you know, if we put on those, those, those spiritual glasses and we look at things from a biblical perspective, I think that there are a lot of things in science and in the arts and in um, the world around us that, that God is willing to show us if we, you know, I, I, I go back, there was an analogy that someone um, said, I heard on the radio this week, that um, a young child was with her father on a, on a railroad and um, the, the topic came up about, you know, human relations and the father, you know, thought for a moment, how can I teach my daughter um, an important lesson? So she, he says, daughter, can you grab my, my um, luggage that's up on the top rack? Now, mind you, his luggage was full of heavy things, and she went and tried to grab it and, and couldn't even budge it. So he said to her, um, you see, daughter, you know, it would be unfair of me as your father to ask you to bear that heavy load because you're, you're just not physically capable of bearing that load now. It's the same thing with this concept of what you're asking about. Um, I'm not going to put more on you than you're able to bear at this time. You're too young to understand and know these things. So even Jesus, when he was dealing with his disciples, he had to give them things in spurts and little tiny, little tiny lessons at a time. Because if he gave them everything all at once, they wouldn't be able to bear it. And I think it's the same thing with God with us. Um, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, more light will come to us, you know, if we walk in the light. Oftentimes we sometimes stumble upon certain things and we, we hit a brick wall to where we can no longer progress in terms of gaining more light and wisdom and knowledge. And I think in that aspect, in terms of the sciences and the arts, the same thing happens. And this is why, um, you know, I think as we get closer to um, the end of probation, as we get closer to the end of this world and, and Christ's second coming, I think there are going to be so many more things. You know, Daniel prophesied, knowledge will increase, right? Knowledge will increase. It's been increasing in steadily um, in almost in exponential rates. True excellence can be achieved by using all that knowledge in a wise way, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Um, Proverbs 1, verse 7. God gives us the Holy Spirit so we can achieve wisdom, knowledge, and artistry. The way we'll be able to distinguish good from evil and to apply our scientific and artistic knowledge this way we'll be able to distinguish good from evil and to apply our scientific and artistic knowledge correctly. Who was the wisest man that ever um, walked the face of the earth? Solomon. Solomon. Now did that wisdom keep him from sinning? Why not? Why not? Because uh, said you had a comment, Mandela? His, his pride came in between. He forgot everything that he had was given by God. Pastor, did you have a comment also? No. Okay. Yeah. So not all, you can have all the knowledge and the wisdom in the world, okay, but there's still that, it, everything is about choice. Solomon knew what right from wrong was, he just chose not to do it. So it's as simple as that. Um, he, and we do know, if you read the story of Solomon, what was his downfall? He went after strange women, right? Which he, was, he knew he wasn't supposed to, but he, you know, what was it, at the, uh, 700 wives, 300 concubines, whatever it was, and they all led him, led him astray, and that's part of the problem. So it's, having knowledge and having wisdom isn't going to keep us from sinning. So we can have all the knowledge and wisdom in the world, but unless you um, have that fear of the Lord, that reverence for God, that's also a part of it. So yes, seeking excellence. Um, conflicts, which was Thursday's lesson, the Lord answered Job. Conflicts between faith and science. What do you do when there's a, conflicts, a conflict between science and faith? And, and Brother Tron, you had mentioned this, that there should, be no, there should be no conflict between science and religion. They should almost be interwoven. And in fact, um, but if there comes a point where there's a, there's a schism between the two, which are you going to believe? The Bible, the Bible yes. You're gonna go, you're gonna, I'm going to go to religion. I'm going to go to what the Bible teaches because I know that God's word is infallible. Okay, How many years has it been around and it hasn't been proven to be false? Yes. The finite mind is not going to understand everything completely. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and Bible even says that about God. He's beyond searchable. There's so many things that it's going to take us millennia, millennia to learn and understand. 
and we think that we can get it in 80 years or here on this earth. It's just not going to happen. You know, it's just, it's just not going to happen. Our minds are not able to bear it all. So God, in his infinite wisdom, gives it to us in pieces. So where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? This was the question that God asked, asked Job. You know, and Job, in, in his, in his um, uh, we know the, the, the turmoil and the persecution that he went through and the, the, the bad things that happened to him, and he began to question God. And God answers and said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. You know, we oftentimes think that we can question God and ask him, but, you know, it's something that it's a loving, trusting relationship that we have to understand that everything that God does is for a reason and that there is no, nothing that he would lay upon us that we cannot bear. And there was no way that he would provide a, um, a temptation or a, um, uh, a trial without providing a way to overcome it. So... Current scientific discoveries show that there is an intelligent design in us and everything around us. This is a clear sign of God's creative hand for those who want to accept it. However, the current philosophy of science rules out the existence of God. Therefore, many scientists believe that the beautiful masterworks of nature were made by chance. And it just goes against common logic that you would have beauty, that you would have symmetry out of chaos. It doesn't happen. You can't recreate that in any, in any laboratory, in any petri dish, and under any microscope. You cannot get uh, symmetry and beauty and perfection from, from chaos. It just doesn't happen. So for them to believe that, it's really, you have to have more faith, right, as they often say, to be an atheist than to be a Christian, right? In many aspects, it requires a lot more faith to be an atheist and to, and to think that we just evolved, that we're just here, uh, and then to believe that we were created in the image of God and, and believe that we have a purpose here on this earth. Um, so the, this philosophy tries to build a wall between faith and science that doesn't exist. Christians believe that God created all things and that he sustains everything. This belief is compatible with every scientific discovery that is interpreted correctly. There's no conflict between science and the Bible and there's no, there shouldn't be any schism. Uh, I do believe that the two will in fact come closer together. In true science, there can be nothing contrary to the teaching of the word of God, for both have the same author. A correct understanding of both will always prove them to be in harmony. Truth, whether in nature or in revelation, is harmonious with itself in all its manifestations. But the mind not enlightened by God's spirit will ever be in darkness in regard to his power. This is why human ideas in regard to science so often contradict the teachings of the word of God. That's the lesson. Thank you for your, for your participation, for your questions, and for your comments. I hope you uh, enjoyed and at least learned something. God bless you. Continue to study. We'll pick up the lesson next week.